Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck and Jerry's here, kvetching, and that makes this the normal episode of Stuff You Should Know. That's right. The continuing bucket of Josh's obsession with psychology and psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> It's so interesting. I know. I love it. These always come from you, and they're always interesting. So let's do it. So we're talking today specifically about a particular study, a very famous psychology study. Um, And the whole thing is kind of rooted in context that you have to know, which is that um, there was a time up until about the 50s when psychiatrists were considered, like, unquestionable. No matter how weird or brutal or potentially life-taking their methods were, if it was if it was a psychiatrist saying this is needed for mental health, then society just went along with it, right? But then at some point in time, there was kind of this backlash against that because people started questioning, like, uh, are you sure you guys know what you're talking about? And if you don't... Um, what you're doing is even more horrific than we thought before. And I was trying to think of a good analogy, Chuck, and the best I could come up with is let's say you gave a group of church officials Mm -hmm. free free reign to hunt witches, torture uh, suspected witches, Mm -hmm. uh, um, violently exercise demons from from, um, people who are possessed, Uh and then society figured out that not that those things don't exist, but that in this case, the church officials themselves don't exist, right? Okay. So, in this case, mental illness does exist, but the, the witch hunters don't aren't actually real. Their methods don't mean anything. They're completely made up. And that was the crisis of confidence that psychiatry was going through in the middle of the 20th century. People started doubting that it had any kind of veracity whatsoever and that they were just torturing mentally ill people to try to figure it out as they went along. Yeah, and I'm not going to get on some anti-medication, anti-psychiatry soapbox But I will say this, and you know this about what's been going on in my private life, but I have seen a very sad situation of someone I love dearly in my own life over the past few years Mm -hmm. deteriorate because while conditions in like, let's just call them asylums, what they called them back then, have certainly improved, uh, there's still a lot of lines that can be drawn to doctors forgetting when it comes to mental illness Forgetting there is a human sitting there in front of them right? Uh, when medication is being thrown at them. And again, the medication can be great, not going on some big tirade against uh, uh, antipsychotic meds and things like that. Right. But uh, I've just seen it happen up close and impersonal, and it is a it is still a very broken system in many ways, and it's really, really sad. Yeah, and what you just mentioned is it's a long-standing kind of um, tack that psychiatry has taken, which is they're battling the disease, and the patient is just kind of an unfortunate casualty of that yeah. battle. Sometimes, you know what I mean. Absolutely. And so finally, people stood up and said, "Like, wait, wait, th- w- wait, wait. We need to like rethink this psychiatry. Like, you guys are giving people lobotomies. You're throwing powerful, um, like psychotropic medications at people that can rob them of their will." Um, and, and rob Problem of their personalities, like we need to rethink this. And something called the anti psychiatry movement started to develop, um, both in the general public and among some psychiatrists and psychologists themselves, and in the Church of Scientology. Yes, yeah, Scientologists hate this stuff, um, but they really are kind of vehemently opposed to the entire idea. It seems like, yeah. whereas this was more like the anti psychiatry movement, especially within the profession, was like, okay, our goals are noble. What we're trying to do is worthwhile. We just don't know what we're talking about yet, and we need to figure out a better strategy. Yeah, and as we'll see, certain things like if you listen to our episode on Titicut Follies, uh, things like that popped up here and there throughout history to make people really pump the brakes and go, wait a minute, how how are we treating people with mental illness in this country? Like, what in the heck is going on? So there was a uh, a person named R.D. Lang who was – um, didn't like to be like fully put in the box of like anti-psychiatry, but was certainly criticizing and questioning 
the fact that, hey, um, we're observing these behaviors. It's behavioral things that we're witnessing, and we're treating them biologically. And like th- there's there's something missing here. There's a piece that's missing. And uh, R.D. Lang was giving uh, a lecture one time that was seen by a gentleman uh, that we're talking about today, David Rosenhan, who was a psychologist. Mm-hmm. And Rosenhan, I guess it, you know, it touched a nerve with Rosenhan, or is it Rosenhan? Do you know? I've always said Han. Okay. Rosenhan? That's, yeah. That's what we'll go with. We definitely won't switch back and forth over. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we definitely won't say them both in succession. Uh, but Rosenhan said, hey, this lecture spoke to me. Um, tagging someone as mentally ill, uh, quote, unquote, mentally ill, is uh, does humans a disservice because that's a tag that they live with, not only in the eyes of others, but to themselves. And it can cause real damage. Um, and some of these people aren't mentally ill. So we need to really take a, a look at this. And I have some ideas on how to tackle it. Yeah. And we should say in this episode, we're going to use the word sane and insane a lot. Uh-huh. And nowadays you would call that healthy or mentally ill. Um, and the reason we're kind of using it like that is, number one, that's the terms they used back then. But also, it's different. It was a different understanding that back then that there, there wasn't gradations of mental wellness. There was you were sane or else you were insane. And once you were insane uh, or labeled insane, you had that label for life. You were in remission, but you still had that, that label yeah. of, uh, you know, that you carried around for the rest of your life. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm glad you made that, actually. Thank you. Uh, So Rosenhan also, at some point uh, previous to this, underwent an experimental eight-day inpatient, uh, you know, and this was – Rosenhan wasn't like – or Rosenhan – ah, there I go – (laughs) wasn't saying, oh, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to try this. Rosenhan said, all right, I'm completely sane. I'm going to check myself in for eight days as an inpatient and see what happened because I want to – maybe convince some of my students to do this. Uh, After he did it, he was like, well, that was intense. I definitely am not going to ask my students to do this. What I'm going to do is design an experiment where we can uh, have non-students do this, and then I can tell them what happened. Right. And the basis of it was just one kind of very central question, right? Right. So um, Rossine Hain um, decided that he was going to design an experiment using those two experiences. And he wanted to see if psychiatrists could do the most basic part of their job, which is identify the difference between a sane person and an insane person. Yeah, and this, it really did make me wonder if he was influenced at all by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I don't know. I saw that he started this in 1969. When was that book published? 62 or 63. Oh, it's entirely possible. And was a stage play. And the whole basis of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was, uh, if you haven't seen the movie or read the book, which is, they're both great. Uh, it was it was a gentleman who was always in trouble with the law, who basically saw a way around going to prison. And that was, um, let me try and convince them I'm insane and Mm -hmm. will be put in a cushy mental institution instead. So the whole basis of that, it's a little different, but was put a sane person in an insane asylum, again, words they used back then, uh, and let's see if I can fool them. Yeah, and that was um, written by Ken Kesey, who figures big time into the electric Kool-Aid acid test, and he was actually on the ward of a state psychiatric facility in either Oregon or Washington. It is Oregon. And... And he, like, witnessed this stuff and ended up writing a book. And he was, as we'll see, along with Rosenhan, man, Chuck, why did you do that to me? (laughs) Along with Rosenhan and a bunch of other people along the the years, he helped contribute to opening society's eyes to the the ills of institutionalizing the mentally ill and how they were treated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So Rosenhan gets in there. I'm going to say Han. Looks like Han to me. Go ahead. And says, all right, here's what I'll do. And this is all in the in the sort of pre-study, like, planning part. Uh, I'm going to call these people pseudo-patients. I'm going to gather together people who are uh, what I would call perfectly sane. They've never had any history of mental illness. They would go to a psychiatric hospital, and they would say, hey, I'm hearing voices. Uh, if it was a man, they would say, I'm hearing a man's voice. If it was a woman, they would hear a woman's voice. And it's sort of unclear what they're saying, but I'm hearing the words, 
uh, empty or thud or hollow. Um, and I figured I should talk to someone about it <laughs> right. and let's see what happens. Yeah, and so later people who came and have studied and analyzed this um, believe that uh, Rosenhan was ta- was trying to simulate uh, existential symptoms, possibly an existential psychosis, that where somebody has some serious concerns about the meaning of existence all of a sudden. They're really concerned that they don't mean anything, that there's no purpose to life, and that he was trying to kind of come up with that using those words. The thing is, after they presented themselves at the psychiatric facility— and they they gave this false initial complaint. They were also required to give a false name. They were also required to give a false occupation because a lot of these pseudo patients were actually psychologists and psychiatrists themselves. Yeah. And that would have raised red flags for sure. But also, he was worried that they would have gotten special treatment. It would have altered the the um, outcome of the, right. the data they were collecting. But other than that, other than those three things, the deception ended there. They were supposed to behave exactly like they normally would uh, as themselves uh, from from that point on. Yeah. So, like, when they did interviews and stuff, whether it was intake or just as they went, although we'll Mm -hmm. see that didn't happen a lot as they went, Mm -hmm. uh, they were to describe their lives as they were, uh, their personalities as they were, their relationships, their medical history. Everything was just straight up and on the straight and narrow. Um, this is very key. They did not take the medications. Uh, they would, you know, do the old trick where you hide them, uh, misery style, and then uh, and then put them like under your mattress or something, or I guess flush them down the toilet. Um, sure. And they were, uh, and of course, Rosenhan is saying <laughs> <laughs> that uh, it's very natural how it happens. It's funny. <laughs> Rosenhan was saying like, hey, if anything, this thing is biased in the favor of these institutions because, like, this is the very barest thing that they should be able to tell if someone is sane or insane. And these are completely sane people. So they should really be recognized as frauds. Like, this shouldn't be too hard for them. Yeah. I mean, like, if you're presented with somebody who has a perfectly normal, perfectly healthy life, background, history, um, like, yeah, you should be able to recognize them as saints. So that was the premise of the whole thing. He also said that they, while they were in there, if they were accepted into the facility, they were to become, quote, paragons of cooperation. Yeah. That if they were given an instruction from somebody on the staff, they were supposed to happily comply and follow it. Um, they were supposed to just kind of go along and get along, not cause any waves or any trouble. And that there, he noticed that there's like a built-in mechanism to kind of support people from to, to be uh, cooperative. And that is that they present themselves as psychiatric patients without anyone in these hospitals being informed that they were there. So they had no idea when they were going to get out. They they needed to be on their best behavior and seem as sane as possible right. so that they could eventually get out. Yeah, and this is where it really differs from Cuckoo's Nest because uh, the main character there, McMurtry, uh, was not cooperative at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, you know, that led to the uh, tragic ending. But um, Man. Yeah, what a movie. What a book. Man. So yeah. great. I never read the book. Is it as, as good as the movie, or is it one of those rare things where the movie's even better than the book? They're both great. It's it's like great book, great movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really good stuff. Um, so the other thing he had in his, uh, or claimed to have in his hip pocket, and you can put a pin in this, mm-hmm. is a writ of habeas corpus for each uh, patient in case uh, they just were like, I got to get out of here. And yeah. the hospital's like, sorry, it doesn't work that way. Uh, habeas, writ of habeas corpus has to do with reporting unlawful detentions. And so uh, Rosenan said, I've got these on hand in case anybody has to get out. Um, and, and I think he presented it to the pseudo patients that way too, right? Yeah, so don't worry. Like if it, if it really, if push comes to shove, I can get you out of there through the courts, basically. So, um, and it is really important to know when you're voluntarily checking yourself into a mental facility for the purposes of a deceptive study, right? Um, 
And one of the things that uh, Rosenhan needed for this study was for his pseudo-patients to take copious notes and observe everything, um, jot down interactions, jot down how they were treated, how other patients were treated, um, just basically everything they could document, they were supposed to document. And Rosenhan was initially really worried that this was going to kind of show the pseudo-patient's hands. So they needed to take these notes secretly. And the pseudo-patients figured out very quickly that no one at the psychiatric facility who worked there could have cared less that they were taking notes the entire time. And in fact, they actually, in at least one case, attributed it to their um, their psychological condition. Yeah. I mean, this, um, I think this speaks to some of the result that we'll find uh, which was there uh, a lot of time was not a lot of active participation from staff to patient. Mm-hmm. So they're like, I don't care. He's writing. Big whoop. Right. You know, there was there was a note in one of their files. Patient engages in writing behavior. But that was it. <laughs> they didn't think it was weird. They didn't think that whatever happened, those patients just took notes on everything. They were insane. And so, of course, an insane person is going to do that. And so the pseudo patients were able to just take notes out in the open the entire time they during their stays. I think when you write engages in and tech behavior on the end, right. you can make anything like Josh and Chuck exhi- ex- exhibited podcasting behavior. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> all of a sudden, someone's coming after us. Right. Uh, all right, so the study is now designed. Um, he starts, uh, he's collected these pseudo patients, these volunteers, I guess, and uh, he wants to collect data. Uh, in the end, um, we should note that he did throw out the data from one participant because they, uh, I think, kept making stuff up while they were in there and right. didn't didn't go with the reality of their life. Um, mm-hmm. And then another, and I have no idea why this person's data wasn't excluded. <laughs> I don't either. But uh, another person tried, and this is very uh, McMurtry-esque, although he hated Nurse Ratchet, but he tried to, uh, to woo a nurse on the premises, uh, said that he was a psychologist, and uh, actually provided psychotherapy to some other patients there. Yeah. I suspect that they didn't throw that data out because it was Rosenhan himself. Oh. That would be my guess. Wowie, and he was like, wow. My, my data is still good. I didn't think of that. Because he was one of the eight pseudo patients yeah. in all who went to 12 different places in this study. Very interesting. I think it's a great place for a break. Yep. All right. I'm going to ponder that whole scene uh, and we'll be right back. All right, so it's 19 uh, – it's funny. It was published in Science in 1973, but I didn't see – I couldn't find anywhere when this happened. When did it actually happen? I saw 69 to 72. Okay, that's weird. I looked in a bunch of places, and it all mm-hmm. just dived right into the thing without saying what year it was. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. I found it in one place. All right, so it's 69 to 72, The Summers of Love, <laughs> and uh, eventually published in Science, which, of course, we've talked about it a lot. It's one of – um, if not the most prestigious academic journal in U.S. history. Sure. So it's not like it was published in Popular Mechanics or something like that. Hey, Popular Mechanics is pretty great. Or BuzzFeed, sorry. BuzzFeed? Let's say uh, Highlights for <laughs> children. <laughs> oh, I love Highlights. Which is the one I was on the cover of? Like bo- like Catholic Boys Life or something? <laughs> like that? I was a Catholic. Oh, no. Guy it was nun- Nun's Life. Guy- <laughs> <laughs> It was spelled N O N E apostrophe S. <laughs> right. uh, so, where were we? All right, it's 1973. It's published in the journal Science. Uh, it was called "On Being Sane in Insane Places," and it's a really great read. Uh, you sent me the original article, and it's awesome. Uh, mm-hmm. You can still find it and read it. It's a really good read because it doesn't take the form of a regular scientific academic journal. Um, doesn't have a lot of data. Not a lot of statistics. Um, not a lot of, a lot of things, um, methodology, like Mm -hmm. results. It's just sort of written out like this kind of, uh, challenge essay, uh, Mm -hmm. which as we'll see ended up, you know, there being a lot of problems with it, but it makes for a much better read than most things in science. 
Yeah, he starts a lot of paragraphs with, oh, here's another thing, too. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, like I said, Rosenhan was one of the eight pseudo patients. There were eight in all. Um, five of them were uh, men. The other three were women. Um, and five of the eight were somehow engaged in psychology or psychiatry. Plus him or so, including him? Do you know? I think I think including him. Okay. Yeah, I think he's included all of those. And um, he sent them to 12 different facilities in five different states on the East Coast and West Coast. Um, and they were all different kinds. He specifically tried to make his sample representative of the kind of facilities that you would find throughout the United States. Yeah. Um, one of them was a private hospital. Eleven were state-run. Um, so not the biggest division there. But they did run the gamut from uh, older kind of rundown places to newer places. Uh, some places had um, really good uh, ratios of patient to staff. Some had really cruddy ones mm -hmm. uh, and not nearly enough staff. Uh, some were research-based and oriented. Some were not at all. So it, it seems at least that he had a pretty decent representation. Right, he did. So um, again, in, in the design of his study, he has set it up to make it as easy as possible for anyone in these psychiatric facility staffs to notice that, you know, this person is actually not mentally ill at all. They're giving us all this information that's contrary to that. So he, he like he said before, um, he biased it in favor of the psychiatric staff finding out that these people were sane. And he said that there were some things that he considered and then dismissed about why they may have been admitted. Because we haven't said it yet, but all eight were admitted in all 12 instances. Um, and one of the reasons he considers they were possibly – that possibly affected the diagnosis and their admi admission was that they were nervous. Like the, the pseudo patients were nervous about yeah, being found out. Of course. They were, they were nervous they were going to be embarrassed or shamed or maybe get into some sort of trouble. Um, and so he said that might have contributed a little bit, but probably, no, not enough to be admitted into a psychiatric facility. So he, he kind of dismisses that thought. But what he says is that they were all really surprised at how easily they were admitted. Yeah, I mean, I think in the late 1960s, when you show up, say you're hearing voices in your head, they believe you and they say, all right, you're uh, schizophrenic and welcome to the facility. Uh, here's your here's your outfit and here's your room and uh, here's your pills. And that's basically what happened. Uh, right. I think they were all save one diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, the one was at the private run, interestingly, institution, and they were diagnosed as what would now be bipolar disorder. Uh, back then, uh, they called it manic depressive psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were all ushered in basically with open arms. Yeah, and I saw in I think a Big Think article on this um – study, they pointed out that, like, this is the opposite of what it's like when you try to get mental health treatment today. It's really hard. It's really expensive. You don't just show up and they let you in and here's your gown and here's your pills kind of thing. So it's kind of interesting in that respect as well. But then once these pseudo patients were in the ward, again, they have diagnoses of schizophrenia now. Um, there wasn't a single in instance where any of their behavior was questioned by the staff or considered suspicious. And um, he got he obtained most of the reports from these visits. And in the files, there's no questioning or suspicion whatsoever about the, the pseudo patients at all. No, I mean, they would uh, the reports were really good in that, that all the people were like model patients and cooperating and friendly and engaging. And like these things were noted, but no one ever said like, uh, and we'll see, you know, some of them, well, we'll get to that point. Cause I think that's one of the more remarkable parts of it is how they noted that. Right. But what they didn't note was like, you know what, this person doesn't seem like there's anything going on with them at all. Mm -hmm. uh, that It was just sort of accepted like they're here. So this is what is going on with them. It's really interesting. Yeah. But that was the staff, right? What about the other patients at the facility? Yeah, this, I think, is super fascinating. They were the only ones that were onto it, the other patients. They were basically <laughs> were like, you're not one of us, and I and we can tell. Um, and I'm trying to remember in Cuckoo's Nest, I think he basically told everyone right away, like the other patients, like, I don't belong mm -hmm. here. Um, and he kind of became the de facto leader. But at uh, these places with Rosenhan – They've they basically said, hey, we don't think you're real. We think you're either a journalist um, trying to expose the facility 
or maybe you're you work for the facility and you're you know in there as a mole kind of checking on things a secret shopper yeah exactly but either way we don't believe you and it seems like in most cases they were uh and i love that you actually put sniffed off the case in the document <laughs> cuz you put this together uh-huh. but they were sniffed off the case generally uh, by just being reassured by the pseudo patients that no, uh, I'm just feeling better. That's why I'm acting this way. Right? Can't you just see Mr. Martini saying like, "I know you're checking I up know. on the hospital." <laughs> yeah, Danny DeVito. <laughs> so there's a thing that Rosenhan points out, and he just kind of brushes past it, but it's kind of important. He says that while the other patients, you know, found them out immediately, um, none of the pseudo patients were closely examined. By the psychiatric staff, yeah. by the actual psychiatrist. They had plenty of interaction with the nurses, the orderlies, you know, the people who, who interact with the patients day to day. But none of them, in all 12 instances, all 12 visits, none of them were closely examined by a psychiatrist. And you can imagine that an inmate uh, or a patient at one of these facilities is going to have the opportunity to really closely pay attention to you and interact with you and see your behavior. So it might have been easier for them just because they interacted with them more. But he defends this, you know, potential flaw in his design and saying, like, these hospitals had plenty of opportunity to closely examine the pseudo patients, and they didn't. So whether that was the reason they didn't find them out or not, it was still a huge failing of the psychiatric system and their process and that they didn't even closely examine these people to see that, oh, no, actually, these people are faking. Yeah, and not to harp on Cuckoo's Nest, but it was written you know, as a as a real thing that mm-hmm. Kesey did. And it, it was, that's what happened in that book. He, you had this initial meeting with a psychiatrist where they diagnosed him. And then it's like, all right, this is where you live now. And these are the orderlies and these are the nurses and this is your life. There was no regular check-ins to see if anybody was getting better. And that was the whole point of this experiment. And in a lot of ways was like, it wasn't being done right. These people were just being sent to live away because they were a hassle for their family. They were being sent to live somewhere else now. Right. So one of the other themes of um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is that, you know, Jack Nicholson is kind of slowly driven crazy, I guess you could say, Mm -hmm. from being institutionalized. It was one of the main themes. Um, And Rosenhan actually, I don't, maybe he did read that book because he accounted for this. Um, He didn't report it, I think, in the study, but um, in a memoir that was found after he died, uh, he apparently had people visit you know, friends visit the patients during their stay and then would interview the friends to see if they noticed any actual change in the pseudo patients and that none of them did. There was no major, you know, noticeable effect of institutionalization that could have accounted for people, you know, mistaking them as, as, um, you know, having schizophrenia or something. Yeah. And this was uh, over the course, what was the average stay? How many weeks? Uh, I think 19 days, almost three weeks for the average. Yeah, so it's it's long enough to where someone could have said to a visitor like, hey, this place is really wearing on me, mm-hmm. starting to lose it a little bit, uh, and apparently that didn't happen. Um, this is the part that I think really fascinated me was that uh, the, the, the more sane they were, which was to say uh, sane appearing, um, the more that was looked at as – a symptom of schizophrenia. Right. So they would act completely normal, be super friendly, um, and very cooperative, and sort of like the writing behavior thing. When they looked at these notes, they would indicate this cooperation or just good sense sometimes to do things as part of their problem. Um, and we'll go over <laughs> a few a few of them. It's, it's shocking. Um, there was one that lined up early for meals, because I guess they were smart enough to know, like, hey, I get at the front of the line, I get whatever, more food or the best food, you know, the best chicken breast. I don't know. I and, saw Well, I saw it explained as there's not a lot else to do or anticipate well, on sure. the ward. So, like, that's that's something to look forward to. Yeah. So, they, they noted that as, as an example of oral, acquisitive, psychotic behavior <laughs> instead of just, like, being hungry and bored. Right, exactly. And that's, uh, that, was, that was a big recurring theme throughout, right? Yeah, this next one was really kind of funny. Um, this one pseudo patient was talking about their marriage uh, and their home life. And they said, well, you know, my, my life's pretty good. My wife and I get along. We have occasional arguments. Um, very rarely I spank my kids. 
uh, which was, you know, something you did back then. So in that context, it was, you know, quote unquote, normal family life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they said that his attempts to control emotionality with his wife and children are punctuated by angry outbursts. And in the case of, uh, in the case of the children, spankings, instead of just saying in, in marriage, they exhibited behaviors of being married. Right. Which is to say occasionally arguing. And again, in those days, like I was spanked when I was a kid. Were you spanked? Yes, I was. And now it's by choice. No. (laughs) Good for you. Uh, What was the other one? What was the... uh... Oh, so that same guy who was trying to control emotionality with his wife... Um, they said that, so during his uh, interview, intake interview, he said that when he was a kid, he'd been close to his mom, but kind of distant from his father. And then as he became an adult, he actually became close friends with his father and just not quite as close with his mom. Yeah. Welcome and to that, adulthood. <laughs> right. That turned into um, a considerable ambivalence in close relationships and that it, his effective stability is absent, meaning he's emotionally unstable. Yeah, like, that's what they gathered from that. <laughs> you know, my brothers and sisters and me—we really fought a lot when we were young. But now that we're adults, we all get along really well. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Like mm-hmm. that is psychotic. So the Rosenhan goes to—he um, goes—he stops and points out, like this is a kind of a major section in the study. He's saying, like, this is the context of the hospital setting. This environment shapes people's perceptions. And he was saying that the people's very sane, very normal personal histories didn't affect the diagnosis of schizophrenia. The diagnosis of schizophrenia altered everyone else's perception of their very sane and very normal personal histories. Yeah, and what really struck me was the – and this is something I I think, you, like I said, you can still see today in some cases – is – the depersonalization that happened. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of constant. It seems like these patients were generally ignored. Um, this is, he, like I said, there wasn't a ton of raw data, but uh, there was a little bit. And one of them was that there were uh, close to 1,500 patient-initiated contacts with the staff, like 1,468 times uh, the eight pseudo patients went up and engaged the staff somehow for some reason. Mm -hmm. And apparently less than 3% of those resulted in actual verbal engagement back to them. So that tells me that they would just say something to them and be ignored 97% of the time. Right. Yeah. They would be ignored. They were powerless because they were stripped of rights. They were mistreated, sometimes violently by the staff. They were just treated like they they weren't there. And they came to kind of question their self-worth just as a part of the institutionalization process. Um, And that was a big, big point um, from this study. And one of the lasting effects it had was pointing this out. Um, And like you said, I think the average length of stay was 19 days. The shortest stay was seven days. Yeah. The longest stay was 52 days. Yeah. Someone was digging it. And in, in 11 out of 12 of these visits, the patients, the pseudo patients were diagnosed with schizophrenia. When they left, when they were determined to be able to return to society, they weren't labeled sane or cured or mentally healthy, they were labeled as having schizophrenia in remission. And that is what Rosenhan was talking about, that once you're labeled insane in our society, especially in the middle of the 20th century, you were insane for the rest of your life. It's yeah. just it, you might not be actively insane at the moment. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I say we take a break because uh, we got a pretty good twist in the story coming up. <laughs> and then we'll finish up about how this whole experiment is viewed these days right after this. Okay, Chuck, so you said there's an extra twist coming, and um, Rosenhan is just showing off at this point. He's running circles around the field of psychiatry, juggling bowling pins that are on fire for fun, right? <laughs> sure. 
Apparently, somehow, this word of the study got out before the publication of the study. And some hospital challenged Rosenhan. They said this could not possibly happen at our hospital. Yeah. So he actually worked with a research hospital um, and said, okay, the staff was informed that over the next three months, one or more pseudo patients was going to be admitted. Yeah. And they had the staff rate the patients <laughs> that were admitted over those three months to see if they could figure out which one was actually faking. Game on. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so of the 193 patients that were admitted to this hospital over a three-month period, um, there were 41 that were sniffed off the case as pseudo patients by at least one person on the nerfing staff. Nerfing? <laughs> you know, they were nerfs. It's the, it's the funnest staff. Uh, 23 uh, were sniffed off the case by at least one psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and 19 of them were suspected by at least a psychiatrist and at least one of the people on the nursing staff. So uh, by at least one or the other, uh, 40, 50, 64 of them were suspected as being pseudo patients and how many pseudo patients did Rosenhan send their way zero not fair trick question <laughs> he's like Wallace Shawn and the Princess Bride all of a sudden <laughs> that's right so yeah he didn't deploy any pseudo patients to the hospital and just basically let them chase shadows Ugh. to to prove that not only could jerk. they not detect <laughs> false negatives, they couldn't detect false positives correctly either. So yeah. in psychology, they call fa false positives and false negatives type 1 and type 2 errors. And he was basically showing like psychiatry is full of judging type 1 and type 2 errors. Yeah, I wonder if there was one person on the staff that was trying to talk everyone into like, he's not sending any. I know it. I know this guy's <laughs> just messing with us. <laughs> they locked that guy up and gave him powerful antipsychotic <laughs> medication. Yeah. So again, I, I'm sure he was very pleased with himself uh, after this challenge. Uh, yeah, I'm went sure his too. Way. Yeah. Uh, and this is at a time, you know, I mentioned Titicut Follies earlier. Uh, this is also a time when there was a, um, you know, a lot of sort of inside looks at what was going on in these hospitals. Thankfully, because so many of them were exposed uh, in the early '70s. Geraldo Rivera. Uh, kind of one of the first ways he made a name for himself was uh, the work he did exposing the Willowbrook State School for uh, the developmentally disabled in, on Staten Island. Right. Um, uh, Titicut Follies, Frederick Wiseman um, did the same thing in the late 60s. And I think even in the 1800s, uh, a journalist named Nellie Bly did sort of the same thing, going undercover uh, to write a book called 10 Days in a Madhouse. And then, of course, Ken Kesey. Yeah, there was Ken Kesey, too. There was a Life magazine spread from 1946 called, I think, Bedlam 46. Uh -huh. And all of these things, like, really shocked the conscience of society over and over and over again. And so together, including this wave of anti-psychiatry, um, Rosenhan's experiment with all these other things helped kind of shape public perception and turn it against, if not psychiatry itself, certainly the large state-run um, depersonalizing institutions that people were typically placed in when they suffered from mental illness. Yeah, and it, you shouldn't be surprised to learn that John F. Kennedy uh, was the first president to really kind of try and tackle this in a substantive way because, um, you know, he very famously had uh, mental illness in his family. They had a lobotomy in his family, right? Yeah, Rosemary. And so he got on it and said, er, uh, Let's put it under the guise of the federal government and mm. get it out of the hands of the state. Was that a that was more bad that or? was more fa <laughs> that was more fat Tony than JFK? Oh, Mayor Quimby, come on! <laughs> um, I know we're all frightened and horny. <laughs> One of the greatest lines ever on The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. So he said, "Let's let's put it under the hands of the federal government. The state-run facilities are." ignored and underfunded and it's a it's a an s show in there he coined that term too sure uh so he signed the community mental health act in 1963 uh, but that was underfunded and that was also an s show yeah so so the responsibility for treating the mentally ill went from the states to the feds but then the feds never funded that bill so the 
treatment of the mentally ill and who is responsible was basically in limbo for almost 20 years. Um, and then Reagan came along and said, how about this? We'll just push it back to the states and we'll give them a little bit of funding, but not enough. And over the years, the kind of ping-ponging between institutions and community-based treatment, states' responsibility and federal responsibility, all these state-run beds were closing and closing, and there were fewer and fewer of them. And so we end up where we are today, which is a mixture of community-based treatment, state-run hospitals, they're definitely still there, and then private treatment, and all of them put together is just not enough. That's why it's so hard and so expensive to get treatment for um, mental health issues today in the United States. Yeah, and uh, although you can't say this is the only reason, that's one of the reason why so many people, sadly, in this country are unhoused today, mm-hmm. uh, including you know veterans, uh, military veterans of the United States. And it's just reprehensible, the blind eye that has been taken over the years. Uh, in the 1930s, there was something called the Penrose Hypothesis, uh, which basically lays most of the blame uh, on uh, imprisonment of the mentally ill and the unhoused population that's mentally ill, uh, squarely at the feet of (laughs) (laughs) de-institute. I can do this. You can. Sound it out. De-institutionalization. Hooked on phonics worked for you. Man, that is a, when you look at that, that's a lot of letters. It is. It's, It's a real bonehead word. I just gave myself a pat on the back. You should. You deserve it, man. Here, you say it right now. Quick. Deinstitutionalization. Ah, oh, you show off. <laughs> <laughs> You've been practicing for once. Anyway, that the- <laughs> doesn't that doesn't mean anything. Anyone who listens to the podcast knows that me practicing has zero effect yeah, on my pronunciation. That's true. Uh, so the Penrose hypothesis lays the blame squarely on that uh, word that you just said. That's very long and uh, impressive. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you know, there's statistics that help back that up. Um, I think from 1880. To 2005, uh, the percentage of people with mental illness in prison rose from less than 1% to 21%. Yeah. And what else about the unhoused? There was a study from the mid-90s that found that the population of the unhoused in the United States was at 100,000 in 1980. And then in 1988, it was up to 400,000. Again, that is spans the entire um, administration of Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And a lot of people lay this at his feet. And again, it's not that clear cut. The Penrose hypothesis is not cut and dried. But those are some pretty startling statistics. And the idea that if you shut down giant state-run institutions and you don't have enough treatment facilities elsewhere, what's going to happen to those people? And it seems like a lot of them end up on the streets or in prison. And that's what America does with its a large part of its mentally ill population today, especially ones that are people of color and other minorities, too. Absolutely. Um, as far as Rosenhan's experiment today, uh, <laughs> how it's viewed, it's um, – why is that funny? <laughs> Anytime you say Rosenhan now, I'm just going to okay, crack tell. up. Um, it, it's a little bit of a Stanford prison experiment view of it, mm-hmm. which yeah. is, um, hey, this was interesting. We learned some things, but it was not rigorous scientifically. There was no randomization. There was no control. There was no sampling or blinding. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't report how you train these participants. Uh, a lot of people have disregarded it, like you know, people that are well respected in the in the community, uh, psychiatric community and psych- psychological community is uh, nonsense and bunk, um, and just heavily criticized. Uh, this one quote is, I think, pretty interesting. It was a neuroscientist uh, named Seymour uh, Ketty that uh, said. This is uh, explanation. If I were to drink a quart of blood and concealing what I'd done, come to the emergency room of any hospital and vomited blood, the behavior of the staff would be quite predictable. Uh, they would label and treat me as having a bleeding peptic ulcer. And I doubt that I could argue convincingly that medical science doesn't know how to diagnose that condition. Right. This is taking it a little far in a different direction, I think, but I, I get the point. I saw it put a little more succinctly by a writer on Psychology Today who said the only thing the study showed was that it is possible to deceive doctors by lying to them. Yeah. So the the study does have its detractors. If you don't share your data, <laughs> like or your methodology, yeah, like it's an, uh, not a scientific paper at base. But 
Rosenhan's experiment has survived all these years because even his detractors say, well, it did a really good job of raising the issue of powerlessness and depersonalization right. in institutions. And that in and of itself me- makes it a worthwhile study or paper, at least, yeah, or I, essay. I think it's super interesting and really interesting to read. And I think I agree. I think it did expose a lot of things, but I don't think you could like point to it as proof of anything necessarily except that the system was pretty messed up. Yeah, and the system is still messed up. I mean, that that, that initial thing that R.D. Lang hit on, that, that psychiatry treats behaviors it observes with biological medicine is still a problem. There's a guy who used to be the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, Thomas Insull, and he said, unlike our definitions of ischemic heart disease, lymphoma, or AIDS, the DSM diagnoses are based on a consensus about clusters of clinical symptoms, not any objective laboratory measure. So psychiatry still finds itself in the same place as ever, and it's now having to fend off kind of um, a, a turf war that's been started by neuroscientists who are like, all this stuff is brain-based, and we're the ones who can look into the brain. We need to be taking over this stuff. And psychiatrists are like, nine in the in the <laughs> tradition of Freud. Uh, and also, by the way, if people listening, uh, you said R.D., the initials R.D. Lang, mm-hmm. not R.D. Lang, if you're wondering what Howard Stern's one-time sidekick, <laughs> co- comedian R.D. Lang, had to do with any of that. Didn't he hang out with Norm MacDonald a lot, too? Yeah, I think they were pals. Okay. I like Artie Lang. It, it, he had some bad troubles for a while. I think he's doing better now. Nice. Yeah, R.I.P. Norm MacDonald, too. Yeah. Uh, so as far as Rosenhan himself, there was a book a few years ago in 2019 from Susanna uh, Callahan. unless you misspelled Callahan. No, I, I really <laughs> wish I had because that's a tough one. It's probably Cahallan. Uh, but it was called The Great Pretender, <laughs> and Susanna was not very – kind to Rosenhan and basically said, this guy's kind of a fraud. Like, I found instances where, uh, first of all, he didn't have that writ of habeas corpus. Man. And he said he did and told them he did, which is really not cool. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what else? Well, some of the data, some of the numbers that he put out there don't match. Like, she tracked one guy down, Bill Underwood, who's a pseudo patient, and that particular pseudo patient supposedly spent seven days in a hospital with 8,000 patients. He actually spent eight days in a hospital with 1,500 patients, which matters if Rosenhan was saying, no, I'm really kind of getting a random sampler, a good sampling of hospitals in America, big ones and small ones, et cetera. If he didn't have an 8,000 patient hospital and 1,500 was the tops, maybe that wasn't as random random as you'd think. Yeah, and she also uh, didn't quite, but came close to accusing him of flat out making up about half the people. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if this is because she only found three plus him Mm -hmm. uh, and said, well, maybe he made up the rest, or was there like actual evidence that he may have just made up the rest? Uh, the former, but she took out a an ad basically as an editorial in The Lancet, which is a British, very respected British medical journal, um, saying like, hey, I'm looking for the other pseudo patients and got nothing, not a single bite, not not a lead or anything. So she wonders if actually they they didn't exist. Interesting. Yeah. And so the thing is, though, it, it, it doesn't really matter. Like, it, it, even if he did make up half the data and half the pseudo patients, it doesn't matter because this study isn't based on the data. It's all about the fact that it kind of shone this light on the way, you know, people are treated and uh, how the mentally ill were treated in the United States at that time. Yeah. You got anything else? No. Good stuff. Nice work. Thanks, man. Nice work, you. Uh, if you want to know more about Rosenhan, Rosenhan, whoever, um, you can look up this article uh, on being sane in insane places all over the internet, and I think you'll enjoy it tremendously. And since I said that, it's time for Listener Mail. Listener Mail. I'm going to call this a couple of quick things on our Mariachi episode. Uh, I'm not going to read this full email, but I did want to point this band out because... Uh, Listen to it, and they're awesome. This is from uh, Jay Detman. uh, Sent in this band, Mariachi El Bronx. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they were originally a punk band from L.A., and apparently they did an acoustic set for a TV show, and they uh, played it with a mariachi style just because it had that energy, and then they were like, hey, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what they're known for now. And I, I played some of it, and it's really awesome. And these guys, a lot of them are uh, Caucasian, and they wear those outfits, and they look awesome. Awesome. See? (laughs) 
Uh, but the real email I'm going to read is uh, from uh, Marlena Maynard. Uh, she, her, hers, who is a voice teacher. So uh, mm-hmm. I imagine Marlena from Nashville knows what she's talking about. Hey, guys, just listen to the episode about mariachi music. I love how you highlighted issues of class and race in the musical and academic world. I'm a classical singer and vocal coach, and as a professional in the field, we certainly have a long way to go in terms of equity and diversity. Uh, but, Chuck, you mentioned that you love hearing many voices sing in harmony. You weren't sure if five-part harmony is a thing. Ho, ho, ho. I have great news, which is that there isn't really an upper limit at all. Nice. Uh, five-part harmony is fairly common in choral music. If a composer wants to fill out a chord, they can simply write another note, and the members of that section will know how to divide accordingly. Uh, you also will encounter a lot of pieces for eight voices, i.e. a double choir, or two soprano parts, two alto, two tenor, uh, and two bass parts. Uh, and then gives an example, which I think people should check out. It's called uh, uh, the piece with most parts, with the most parts that I'm aware of is Spem in Allium by Tomas Talis. Uh, mm-hmm. This is from the early 16th century. Sure. And it's got 40 vocal parts. Wow. Uh, so just go look that up. S P E M uh, I N A L I U M on YouTube. And then there's a couple of more. Um, and also list uh, a Bach one. Um, and this is Marlena's favorite five part choral pieces the second movement of Jesu Meine Freude by J.S. Bach. Very nice. So go check all those out. Check out Mariachi El Bronx. They got a great tiny desk concert, among other things. Those are always fun to watch. You ever see those? Yeah, I saw one uh, when we did the mariachi, when the Flora, de, I can't remember, the all, all-woman all um, four-piece mariachi band from New York. Yeah, hats off to NPR. The tiny desk concert has long been one of my favorite things. So, Chuck, since we're talking music, though, I want to just go ahead and give a shout-out, an announcement, you could say. Ooh. You ready for this? Did your niece write an album? <laughs> Not yet. She's working on it. Um, instead, uh, you asked for it, and they're giving it to you on November 22nd oh, and 23rd, yeah, baby. 2022. <laughs> Diarrhea Planet is reuniting in Nashville. What's this because of us? <laughs> I, I probably, I'm just going to, I assume everything is because of us. No, I don't think it is, but uh, I want to go to that show. I bet you that place is going to go off because they haven't yeah. played together in three or four years. No, they broke up in 2018. So they're going to be at the Exit Inn in Nashville, November 22nd and 23rd, if you want to make a pilgrimage there. You know, I'm looking at my calendar. When it, that's it's a bad time of year, Diarrhea Planet, right at, <laughs> at Thanksgiving. Uh-huh. Right around my wife's birthday, but mm-hmm. hmm, I've been in more trouble in my marriage, so <laughs> Nashville's pretty close. I'm going to the, see Stevie Nicks. Surely I can go to see Diarrhea Planet there. Emily's like, you skipped my birthday to see who? <laughs> yeah, Phantom Planet with Jason Schwartzman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, Chuck, uh, well, who was the the uh, the original, the two people who wrote in? Marlena is the vocal coach, and Jay turned me on to Mariachi El Bronx. That's right. Thanks, Marlene and Jay. And if you want to point out some cool music we've never heard before, we love that kind of thing. You can send us an email to stuffpodcast at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.